Jean Schnupp here. Welcome to another new Savvy Sightseer video vacation. Today we are off to London, England. London is one of my favorite cities. I've had the good fortune to visit several times, usually staying with or at least meeting up with friends. Every time I go, I find something new to enjoy, like Winston Churchill's hidden war bunker right below the most heavily trafficked streets of England's capital city. And of course, new things are always being added, like the opening of the Westminster's galleries, essentially an attic space that had been jammed with relics that were hundreds of years old. These were cleaned up and put on display for the first time in 2018. Wander along the Thames, the river that bisects the city, and you encounter any number of famous places, from Shakespeare's Globe Theater to Parliament and Big Ben, with some lesser known ones in between. Venture just a short distance from London proper, and there's Windsor Castle and charming little towns. So come along with me now and let me share with you my must-see stops in and around London. We'll start in the heart of town with probably one of the most recognizable icons of London's skyline, Big Ben and the Palace of Westminster. According to UNESCO, which awarded them World Heritage status in 1987, their intricate silhouettes have symbolized monarchy, religion, and power since Edward the Confessor built his palace and church here in the 11th century. Power indeed is centered here, where the houses of commons and lords, Great Britain's ruling bodies, meet. But for most tourists, the clock tower attached to Parliament is what draws their interest. Although commonly referred to as Big Ben, that is not the tower's name. Rather, it is the 14-ton bell inside the structure that is called Big Ben, probably from the name of the man who first ordered it cast, Sir Benjamin Hall. Originally, the 316-foot tall structure was named the Clock Tower, or St. Stephen's Tower. But even that's wrong now. In 2012, for the Diamond Jubilee of Queen Elizabeth II's 60-year reign, it was renamed the Elizabeth Tower. The clock is the largest in Great Britain. Its four faces are each 23 feet in diameter, the hour hands are 9 feet long, and the minute hands are 14 feet long. The numbers are approximately 2 feet high, and there are 312 pieces of glass in each clock face. The tower took 13 years to build, and its mighty bell chimed for the first time in 1859. In 2017, it went silent, except for a few special occasions, while a multi-year restoration project is underway. It's expected to ring out regularly again sometime in 2021. Across the river is the Coca-Cola's London Eye. It was added to mark the millennium in 2000. At 443 feet high, the world's largest cantilevered observation wheel is technically not a Ferris wheel since it's supported on only one of its two sides. That allows, though, for continuously unobstructed views of the river and the landmarks from its 32 high-tech glass capsules. It's a very slow, gradual rotation of 360 degrees in one of its 25-person capsules. You can take about 30 minutes to make the full rotation. Another Millennium addition is the sleek pedestrian-only Millennium Bridge that spans the Thames from St. Paul's Cathedral to the Tate Modern on the southern side. It opened to great fanfare in June of 2000, but the steel suspension bridge was closed virtually immediately. The problem, it wobbled, and that earned it the nickname of the Wibbly Wobbly. Designers had not allowed for the effect of large numbers of people all starting out at the same time and walking across the span in the same cadence. So officials had to fork over about a few more million pounds and spend almost two years correcting the mistake. For about 1,400 years, a cathedral dedicated to St. Paul has stood at the highest point of the city. The present version is at least the fourth on the site and is England's largest Protestant church. It was designed by royal architect Sir Christopher Wren in the late 1600s, and it's one of the largest cathedral domes in the world. The structure itself is about 515 feet long and 227 feet wide. Below the ground, the area is filled with a cavernous crypt, the largest in Europe. Many famous people have been interred there, including John Donne, the poet, Van Dyke, an artist, Horatio Nelson, the admiral, the Duke of Wellington, a soldier as well as a prime minister, 
Florence Nightingale, the famous nurse, and, of course, the cathedral's architect, Sir Christopher Wren, which led my family on a search for his memorial. After passing huge memorials like this one for the Duke of Wellington, we finally found just a simple plaque with Christopher Wren's name on it. We were confused until reading the epitaph composed by his son. Said reader, if you seek his monument, look around you. Well, I guess he had a point. There couldn't be a greater sculpture than the mass of St. Paul's the architect had built. The London skyline is littered with the great works of Sir Christopher. A, a great fire began in London on the night of September 2nd, 1666. It beca began as a small fire on Pudding Lane in the bake shop of the baker to King Charles II. The devastation was immense. Some 430 acres, as much as 80% of the city proper was destroyed, including 13,000 houses, 89 churches, and 52 guild halls. One of the many structures that Sir Christopher was tasked with rebuilding after the fire was St. Bride's Church. It would be the seventh church to stand there over a course of 2,000 years. He topped it with his tallest steeple, a striking 230 feet. Baker William Rich was due to be married at St. Bride's in the late 18th century. He wanted to create a spectacular cake for the wedding and was inspired when he looked up at the church and he developed a cake in layers, tiered and diminishing as it rose. Thus began the tradition of the tiered wedding cake. As part of the rebuilding, it was decided to erect a permanent memorial of the Great Fire near the place where it began. Wren contributed to the design for a dark column topped by a drum and a copper urn of flames, symbolizing the Great Fire. 311 steps take you up to a viewing platform. It's a long 311 steps, I can tell you. The column is simply called the Monument, and it is 202 feet tall, the exact distance between it and the site in Pudding Lane where the fire began. Of course, one of the most iconic structures in London is the famous Tower Bridge, built in the late 1800s. A pair of high-level open-air walkways 143 feet above the Thames lets pedestrians cross even when the drawbridge is up, which happens about a thousand times a year. Ships have the right-of-way over motor traffic, as Bill Clinton's motorcade discovered in 1997. The parade was split when crossing, and the bridge was raised to, to let a scheduled barge pass. We tried to contact the American embassy, but they wouldn't answer the phone, said a Tower Br Bridge spokesman. Many mistakenly call this London Bridge, which is nearby. Memorialized in the nursery rhyme, My Fair Lady, London Bridge had to be rebuilt several times because it was indeed falling down. The rhyme's ending was a dig at Queen Eleanor in 1282, who was known to redirect bridge funds to her own spending money fund. The more ornate Tower Bridge was designed to match local architecture, but it is not made of stone. Rather, it is 11,000 tons of steel. Tower Bridge gets its name from the notorious Tower of London to which it leads. Considered the most secure castle in the land, the one-time royal palace is mostly known today for its tower, which is a visible symbol of awe and fear. From its inception, the massive stone fortress built by William the Conqueror in the 1070s was intended to instill fear in the newly conquered British. Kings and queens imprisoned their rivals and enemies within its walls. Prisoners were brought in by water through the traitor's gate. There are stories of prisoners, rich and poor, that still reportedly haunt the tower. One of the most famous legends of the tower surrounds its ravens. The story goes that should the six ravens leave the tower, both it and the kingdom will fall. The raven master occasionally trims some of the raven's primary and secondary flight feathers to uh, encourage them to stay at the tower. Though he claims the birds could fly if they wanted to, he just makes them very comfortable and they'd rather stay, he says. Westminster Cathedral is a must-see attraction in London, even for people who have visited before, since a major new addition has been made. The church is as much an historical site as a religious one. Since 1066, every royal coronation, except for Edward's V and VIII, has taken place in this church. About 3,300 people are buried in the church and its cloisters. Some of the most famous are Charles Darwin, 
Sir Isaac Newton, and David Livingston, and of course royals, Queen Elizabeth I, Mary Queen of Scots, and St. Edward the Confessor. Westminster is an ongoing work in progress. In 1998, the statues of the martyrs were added to the west entry of the already statue-heavy building. In the center, we have Martin Luther King Jr., and they weren't done yet. In 2018, the Abbey added an elevator, the first physical addition to the Abbey since its iconic towers were completed in 1745. The elevator whisks visitors up to about 70 feet above the, the church floor to the Queen's Diamond Jubilee Galleries, a sort of attic space not open to the public before. Historians speculate the area was probably intended for extra chapels, but it was never used for anything but storage. And just like most people's attics, there were some great finds as well as well, a few oddities. You had royal armor for, to the world's oldest known stuffed parrot. There are dozens of statues, King Henry V's saddle, shield, and helmet, a wooden Dutch clog, a clay pipe, Mary II's coronation chair, and for fans of more recent royals, Will and Kate's marriage license. Thousands of artifacts were restored and are now on view for the public. Arguably, the gallery's piece de resistance is this panorama of the Abbey. Until now, such a vantage point has only been seen by the public during TV broadcasts. Grills and handrails allow visitors to step right to the edge of the open arches for somewhat dizzying views down to the altar and the royal tombs below. Tucked away on King Charles Street in London is the entryway to Church Churchill's secret World War II command post. The underground bunker served as the Prime Minister's center of operations from 1939 to 1945, the close of World War II. When staff turned out the lights and left the bunker for the last time, no one was really sure it wouldn't be needed again, and so it remained completely intact until 1984 when they were first open to the public. Even the handwritten calendar in the maps room still bears the last date of use, August 16, 1945. Visitors here get a true sense of the beehive that operated under the streets of London. Mannequins fill in for staff and soldiers at their workstations. Conference rooms and living quarters for everyone, including Clementine Churchill, the Prime Minister's wife, are open to see how these people lived for six years. All the clocks are set at 458, just before the time of the first meeting. The adjacent museum portion is a unique biographical look at every aspect of the leader's life, told through his trappings, including his trademark bowler hat. You hear his booming voice. There's dioramas and news reports and videos, and so much more. It is a highly interactive multimedia experience that shares insights into the statesman, the family man, the leader, and the visionary by engaging and challenging visitors with cutting-edge technology and distinctly different displays. An array of thought-provoking and interesting exhibits, I found it to be too much to fit into one visit. You sort of go into overload. So I kind of plan now to stop in every time I visit London and pick up where I left off the prior time so I can really do it justice. In most museums, you look at a picture like this and just read a news blurb, but not here. As you stand in front of this picture of London being bombed, you listen to Churchill's booming voice discussing it. Beneath the gruff exterior, Churchill was a man of simple pleasures who enjoyed the solitude of painting. He wrote, when I get to heaven, I mean to spend a considerable portion of my first million years in painting. As a former English teacher, seeing the Globe Theater where Shakespeare's plays were acted out was a must. It's not the original theater, though. That was demolished in 1644. A project to rebuild it was initiated by the American actor, director, and producer Sam Wanamaker after his first visit to London in 1949. In 1997, very near the site of the original, a replica of the 1599 theater was open. Just as the original was, this is an open-air theater, and plays go on, rain or shine, no umbrellas permitted. The sumptuous stage and roof decorations were created by using Renaissance techniques and pigments. A short walk takes you from the replica 16th century architecture to ultra-modern 21st century buildings. An architecturally striking building, 
nicknamed the gherkin for its unique look, caused a stir when it was started in 2001 because of its height, 591 feet tall. It is decidedly not an old English look. The office building has 7,429 panes of glass on its exterior. Something that sets this building apart from its surroundings is the remains of a young Roman girl which was discovered during the early stages of construction. Estimated to be 1,600 years old, her remains were moved during construction and then returned amid much fanfare to be reburied at the base of the tower on completion. The gherkin is now dwarfed by the shard on the right side of the screen. This is London's tallest structure at 1,016 feet. The architect's vision for a so-called vertical city incorporating retail, offices, hotel, apartments, restaurants, and a public viewing gallery was realized when the building was inaugurated in 2012. The shard stands 95 stories tall with a dazzling exterior covered by 11,000 glass panels. These are just two of a growing group of unusually named skyscrapers in London. They are joined by the cheese grater, the walkie-talkie, and soon the tulip. The British Museum, founded in 1753, was the first national public museum in the world. It grew out of the extensive collection of Sir Hans Sloan, a physician married to the heiress of a Jamaica sugar plantation who had amassed a huge collection of more than 80,000 what he called natural and artificial rarities. The museum has now grown to about 8 million objects covering 2 million years of human history. And best of all, it's free. One of the most famous objects in the British Museum is the Rosetta Stone. It contains a passage carved in three different types of writing. That helped experts learn how to read Egyptian hieroglyphs. It certainly is an eclectic collection. The mechanical galleon from about 1585 is an automaton ship. It announced the start of a banquet at court by playing music inside the hull, after which the ship sailed along the table to the end and then fired a cannon to announce dinner. And then there's this guy on the right, one of hundreds of large stone sculptures found on Easter Island. Specialists have dated it to about 1200 AD. One of its premier exhibits is the collection known as Elgin Marbles. Okay, I confess I was actually expecting to find a group of little marbles. But it turns out they are marble sculptures taken from the Parthenon in Greece. They were brought to London in 1803 by Thomas Bruce, a nobleman and an ambassador. And he was more commonly known as Lord Elgin. The original friezes that wrapped the Parthenon were 520 feet long and represented one of the most important religious festivals in Athens, in honor of Athena, the city's patron goddess. The pieces in London measure a total of 247 feet. The museum's stunning inner courtyard is the largest covered public square in Europe. It is a two-acre space enclosed by a spectacular glass roof with the world-famous reading room at its center. Work on the Great Court was completed in 2000. It was constructed out of 3,312 panes of glass no two of which are the same. The residence most often associated with the royals is Buckingham Palace in the heart of London. It's the sovereign's official London residence and re administrative headquarters. George III acquired then Buckingham House from the Duke of Buckingham in 1761. It didn't become an official re royal residence until years later. Queen Victoria was the first sovereign to use the palace as her official residence in 1837. There's 775 rooms, including 78 bathrooms. The Palace Garden is the largest private one in London, covering about 39 acres and includes a three-acre lake. An invite to one of the Queen's summer garden parties is a real coup. More than 30,000 guests attend her garden parties every year, about 8,000 on each occasion. At a typical garden party, about 27,000 cups of tea, 20,000 sandwiches, and 20,000 slices of cake are consumed, served by about a staff of 400. This is the view of the Thames we are most familiar with, busy with pleasure boats and barges. It wasn't always so pleasant. Much of the city's waste was dumped into the River Thames. In 1858, the stench from all that sewage in the river was so bad that Parliament had to be suspended. It wasn't until 1865 that London's sewer system was installed.
The Thames is part of the longest river in England. Starting as a small trickle in the Cotswolds, it travels over 210 miles through the heart of some of England's most picturesque towns, right into the center of London and eventually out to the North Sea. It has 45 locks like this one at Bolter's Lock in Maidenhead. It was built in 1825 to replace a former lock that dated back to 1772. Traveling at least some of the Thames is a very popular pastime with boaters of all sizes. Once out of London proper, it changes its character completely. In 2000, the last salmon ladder to be built on the Thames was opened at Bolter's, one of about 50 weirs along the river. This is actually part of the Thames, which splits to surround a peaceful island park. Yes, outside the big city, the Thames has a very different look. A nice thing about visiting with friends is that they take you to places not in regular guidebooks, and that's how I came to be at Bolter's and all the, uh, the little town of Bray nearby. It's a lovely little town, about 30 miles west of London, with medieval roots. It regularly wins awards for its prettiness in the uh, Britain in Bloom competitions. Even royals like to leave the hustle and bustle of city life behind sometimes. Near Bray is one of the most famous of the monarch's getaway palaces. Windsor Castle is the oldest and largest inhabited castle in the world. It has been the family home of British kings and queens for almost a thousand years. The country residence is the queen's favorite weekend getaway, but it is also a working palace and it's used regularly for ceremonial and state occasions. St. George's Hall, the largest room in the castle, makes a spectacular setting for a state banquet when a single mahogany table stretching the length of the hall with 68 leaves to be 175 feet long. It was created in 1846 and can seat 162 people at one time. Forty monarchs have called the castle home and many additions and changes have been made along its long history. For example, Henry III started building this D-shaped tower in the early 1200s. It was later granted to nearby Eton College to use as a belfry and the college's bells and clocks have hung here ever since. William the Conqueror first chose the site for Windsor Castle high above the River Thames and on the edge of a Saxon hunting ground. It's about 25 miles west of London. He began building it in 1070. It took 16 years to complete. During World War II, the young princesses Elizabeth and Margaret stayed at Windsor while their parents supported the war effort in London and around the country. A major fire engulfed about one-fifth of the castle in 1992. It took 15 hours and one and a half million gallons of water to put it out. Nine principal rooms and about 100 of the castle's nearly 1,000 rooms was also ruined. It took five years and 37 million pounds to restore it. 70% of the cost raised to pay for it came from opening Buckingham Palace for tours. The Long Walk is a nearly three-mile path from the castle to the Great Park or the Royal Hunting Forest. Just off the Long Walk is Frogmore House, built in 1680. It's extremely private and mostly off-limits to the public. Harry and Meghan made Frogmore a household name in 2019 when they famously chose it for their prime resi residence and renovated it at a whopping cost of about $3 million before ditching the royal family in 2020 and moving to the United States. While there are many beautiful things to see at Windsor Castle, the one item that sets it apart from all the other elaborate royal residences is not the immense two-ton Indian carpet, considered to be the largest in the world. Quite the opposite, my favorite, is in miniature. A childhood friend of Queen Mary, Princess Marie Louise, decided that the queen, who loved all things tiny and decorative, would enjoy having a dollhouse. It became a symbolic gift to recognize the queen's service during World War I. Renowned architect Sir Edwin Lutons designed the five-foot-tall dollhouse on a scale of one to twelve, one inch equaling one foot. But it took 1,500 artists and craftsmen to bring it to life between 1921 and 1924. It is the largest and most famous doll's house in the world, and is more luxurious than many life-sized homes. No detail was too small to be overlooked. There's running water, electric lights, working elevators, and I'm not sure for whom, but it has flushing toilets. The garage houses a Daimler and a 1923 Silver Ghost limo. Every room is exquisite. Those are real books on the shelves, not a painted wall. Princess Marie sent one inch by one and a half inch blank volumes to writers and poets to fill in. 
Sir Arthur Conan Doyle sent back a handwritten, leather-bound, 503-word story called How Watson Learned the Trick. Other original stories, poems, or music pieces came from hundreds of famous people of the period. Rudyard Kipling, A. A. Milne, Thomas Hardy, J. M. Barry, and Aldous Huxley. In the wine cellar, 1,200 thimblefuls of real booze are kept in miniature bottles. The royal gunmakers, James Purdy and Sons, donated working replicas of King George V's guns, complete with a leather case and a magazine of 100 tiny cartridges. In the town of Windsor, adjacent to the castle, there are some interesting spots. Queen Charlotte Street on the left is just under 52 feet long, giving it bragging rights as Britain's shortest street. On the right is the Market Cross House, and it has a colorful history and obvious structural issues. It has changed hands a number of times with different oper businesses operating the slightly unbalanced shop, but it is best known as the Crooked House of Windsor. It had been demolished in 1687, but a land dispute erupted over the lot, and the council was eventually ordered by the court to rebuild the dwelling in its original spot. The job was hastily done using unseasoned wood that buckled when it dried, leaving it standing but a little off kilter. It is said to be one of Windsor Town's most photographed buildings. Also getting lots of camera time are these stunning regal-looking swans. Well, in addition to looking regal, they really are regal. Since the 12th century, by law, the queen owns any unclaimed mute swan. That's a species of orange-billed swan found in open water in both England and Wales. Swans were considered a delicacy, and to keep them from being depleted by peasants, they became the property of the monarch. Anyone driving away swans at breeding time or stealing eggs was liable to one year's imprisonment plus a fine at the pleasure of the crown. Any person carrying a swan hook by which swans might be taken from the river were, was liable to a fine. Every year, the third week of July, there is a five-day census of all the swans in the River Thames. It's called the Swan Upping. I hope you've enjoyed your trip to London, and I like to end all the programs uh, with the words of Dr. Seuss. Sometimes you don't appreciate the moment until it becomes a memory. I like to add to that to always remember to celebrate the moments and treasure the memories. To see more of London, England, or any of my European destinations, go to my website. You can find the London section under the links to Southern England. If you have any questions about this program, email me or use the contact page on my website. When libraries are again offering programs, you can check my programs tab to see where I'll be. Until then, visit the library site for more video vacations by Savvy Sightseer. Stay healthy, stay home, cheerio!